Hi everyone, this is Craig Morgan with Blended Together Forever. And here in a few minutes, I'm gonna to introduce to you a senior pastor, my friend Rick Lamb. Rick is the senior pastor at Northside Baptist Church in Corsicana, Texas. And uh, last year, we had a chance to go down and really spend the day with him and his church. In fact, my wife Gina and I were talking to their congregation and they were opening a new small group for blended families in their church. And I was so elated to hear how Rick had said, we have a need and we want you to come down. We're looking for a speaker. We want to kick off a small group. And would you and Gina come down and just share your story and, and talk to our, our church? And we did that. Um, I guess, goodness, Rick, it wasn't a year ago. It was more like six months ago. My, my dates go bad. they crazy. And not exactly sure either. It was sometime last fall. Yeah, there you go. So excited to have you on. And uh, thank you again for doing this very much, Rick. Very much welcome. Very, very glad to do it. Thanks a lot for having me. You bet. Um, you know, one of the great things that happened for me when we were down there is you gave such a powerful testimonial to your church. And at the very end of our conversation, you addressed them. And you uh, really were touching the heart of everybody in the congregation that day. Um, tell me more about that, because blended families kind of feel a little ostracized at times from the church. Maybe they've had a marriage that's already failed, and so they already kind of feel like, well, I'm not a first-class Christian. I mean, there's lots of things that go through it. But you said a very powerful statement to your church at the end. Do you mind sharing that with us real quick? Well, if I can remember what it was about, but I, I think at the beginning, Craig, what I was, I was kind of apologizing, you know, because in the, in the church, we have so many things that draw our attention and we focus on, and you know, our goal is we're trying to build lives. We're trying to build people that are strong Christians and encourage them in the ways of the kingdom and so forth. And sometimes, you know, we get frustrated when people are not there week after week after week and and we get a little, uh, you know, wondering, like, where is everybody and thinking through that. And then when we start to think about blended families, we think about several things. One, that this is the reality of our world nowadays, you know, and we, we have a way that we wish things were, but that's not reality. And we could uh, curse the darkness all day long or we can light a candle. The old saying goes, you know, we can look at this is what it is. So. I can't remember the exact statistics and you know them better. You can share those 43% or whatever of people in our churches are blended families. So we have to be understanding. And I think what I was thinking about is just a little bit apologetic how sometimes we're not, you know, we're not aware that people who are not there on a certain weekend or a certain day, maybe that's the day that they're with the other parent that they have to go to the other family. And uh, we, we should, uh, learn to take them whenever they're there and uh, and realize that this is a large part of our mission field. And uh, we are here to help people build uh, these marriages to make them whole and make them strong and, you know, show a lot of grace and a lot of kindness. And so what we ask you down there for is to help us just kind of develop an awareness of this whole issue, how prevalent it is in our churches. And uh, that's what I was trying to do is just encourage people toward understanding this is the reality and uh, how can we uh, help people better. You did an incredible job. You touched everybody's heart because it was a posture of just love, acceptance, and, and saying, if we've ever offended you, we really do apologize. And I tell you what, it's, it will hit the heart of every blended family. And here's why. Blended families are formed out of a loss. They've mm. already had something bad that's happened that they didn't want. Right. Nobody goes to the altar and says, I do when they get married and it ends up being, I don't. And then they try it a second time. So they already feel, oh goodness, one marriage has already failed. Or in another case, there's a spouse that's passed away and remarried. And then kids are brought in and they go, well, dad, you can get a new wife, but I can't get a new mom. So there's some tedious things they're walking on. And so when you approached it with just grace and love and, 
and almost apologize. Like you said, you know, we're sorry if we, if we don't mean that. It, that is a message that should go out everywhere. Well, thanks uh, so much. You know, and I do remember now, I remember sharing that, that we have to be aware of the various reasons why there are these new families. Sometimes in the original family, there was abuse, and there is a lot of that that goes on. And so, you know, very serious situation. Sometimes there was abandonment. You know, that somebody was just abandoned by a spouse. I have a good friend in ministry who was abandoned by a spouse. And, and sometimes those things happen, you know. And so just to be aware, you know, we all need the grace of God. We all need his love. We all need compassion. And we need also to show it. And I'll tell you, honestly, that for me as a pastor, one thing that this has helped do is help me to think about how I say things with families that are in our congregation. It's not always the family that's been together for 30 years and the children and so forth. You know, it, it just to be aware that it's a, it's a new uh, blended family or step family that might be involved in, in uh, understanding a lot of the dynamics they go through. So I think it's caused me to be, I hope, you know, more graceful toward the way that I treat people. Right. That's a great point. Um, you mentioned about the reality Mm -hmm. of blended families. I want to go down that road for just a second. I'll give you a couple of statistics that probably a lot of pastors are unaware of. Okay. 40% of the kids today are raised in some type of a blended family. Of every three marriages that occur this weekend, one of those three is going to create mm -hmm. a blended family. Wow. Already 113 million step, uh, uh, excuse me, 113 million adults that have at least one step family type relationship, mm -hmm. and it's growing, and yet the church as a whole doesn't really have a program that's for that. And you mentioned this is a reality. Why would pastors need to? If I can say this, like, hey, wake up and look at who's in your congregation, because it is a reality today. Talk, me, talk more about that. Well, there are a lot of other areas in the same kind of vein that it is a reality. And so, you know, we, we have to be aware of a lot of the dynamics that are involved. Uh, a lot of people are searching for their new normal. These kids are searching for their new normal. And uh, maybe they have two moms now, you know, that are uh, that uh, the previous uh, husband's wife and, and then new mom. And they're trying to deal with all of that and figure that out. And uh, we have to respect that and understand that. So, you know, that, I think the children, I think about these children that yeah. it's one thing for parents to have to adjust and adapt and so forth. But kids, you know, they are really trying to find their new normal in life. And sometimes, you know, to explain all of these things, you know, who, which mom is going to come to the after school meeting with the teacher, which mom is going to bring me to church, which mom, you know, is going to pick me up. And uh, it gets confusing. So this is the reality. And like I said, we can just get upset about it and say, we wish our world was not like this, but this is the time in which we've been called to minister. So this is what we have to deal with, you know, and try to help the best way that we can. I like what you said. We can either, you know, curse the darkness or try to be a light. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of marriage resources. There's a lot of parenting resources, but there's not a lot of blended family resources. And one of the things that's been made very apparent to me is that you can't do marriage and family ministry the same way. Uh, let me talk about that for a second. Then I want to get your opinion. Okay. In a typical marriage or family, you know, you may talk about communication. You may go to a marriage conference. You may talk about parenting with your children and the styles that you grew up with from your own parents. We could make a list of the traditional nuclear marriage and family pattern. But when that model has been broken and there's remarriage or like you said, abuse, abandonment, you know, and, and you come together and it's not the same recipe. This blended family deals with different issues that a nuclear family will never deal with. So as an example, uh, they have an ex-spouse. 
They may have some loyalty conflicts because not everybody shares the same last name. I mean, there's a whole list of things. So the reality, like you said, you're embracing, we have to do something for blended families in addition to marriage and family, uh, traditional way we've done it. That's, that's so powerful. How did, I'm grateful, but that obviously the Lord enlightened you on that. Talk to me more about why not only your church down at Corsicana, but others should probably wake up to that same reality. And they're, they're sitting in their pews on Sunday as well. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, I think the first step, just like I said at the beginning, just an awareness, this is what's going on. It's what's going on all around us. And you have children in these homes that are now adopting to new parent styles and they need help. I think you shared a statistic about second marriages. You know, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of times those end in divorce as well, the difficulty in maintaining that. So we have an ongoing class on Wednesday nights and we have a wonderful lady right now uh, um, who's about my age. I started to say a little older, but she's my age who is teaching this class. And I think three fourths of the people in there are part of blended families. And she addresses everything from uh, the parenting style, the uh, discipline style, uh, nurturing faith, and then just the con you know the normal things of communication and all of that. And uh, so you know, I think that it's very important for pastors just to understand how can we really help the people in our church the very best that we can. And and this is one way that needs not be neglected. You know, it's something that needs the awareness needs to be out there. So it starts with awareness. Then you got to have plan in place. And you know, it is good if you can find somebody who has a little bit of a passion about families and just wants to help families the very best way they can. And uh, that's that's great to find that person with that spiritual gift and that encouragement and all of that. And you know, they will start to root out where the resources are like your organization. We found that from a parent in our church. Right. You know, I didn't go and find you. you. We found that from a parent in our church who found you and said, hey, there's this guy. And I thought, wow, that's really good stuff. And then they start, you know, the Lord will make a way if people have that desire to be of help. And uh, so that's kind of where it starts for me is the awareness. And, you know, I'll say as the senior pastor that senior pastors a lot of times are champion for the things that go in our churches. If we're not the champion for those things, a lot of times they will never happen because you can't just assign this to a staff member. You have to be the one who pushes it in a nice way. You know what I mean? But it just won't get the attention if you don't have the senior pastor behind it. It's not something we have to do every single week and we have to, you know, make a big deal about, but that constant awareness, it's up to the senior pastor. That's a great point. I really appreciate you stating that because I agree a hundred percent that if, you give wind to it and belief, then it's going to resonate within the congregation. Yeah. Um, one big question of, uh, you could say pushback with a lot of churches, and it's always the divorce question. I'll come back to that, and then I want you to speak to that. I love when, when we were down there, when Gene and I spoke, you quoted one of my heroes too, Chuck Sundahl. You said, Chuck always said, keep the standard high but expect imperfection because we're dealing in people's lives and ministry is messy. And, and so we're not saying water down the standard. God, God's standard was the only correct, perfect standard. One husband, one wife, four lifetime till death do you part. That is the standard. Uh, but when that jar has been broken and there's pieces on the floor and it, and there's kids and grandkids and stepchildren and aunts and uncles and a single dad or a single mom, you don't just leave the pieces on the floor. You got to do something with it. So how do you connect the dots of the stigma of, well, we don't want to really embrace blended families because some people might think we're endorsing divorce, which you're not with lives that are over here and you're trying to mesh the two together. If you could talk from a pastor's perspective to that dynamic, I think would be really enlightening for a lot of people. Well, you know, it, you're exactly right. Expect perfection, but accept humanity. We, we have the standard, we keep holding it up. But isn't this true in almost everything else? We have a standard that we hold up 
but then there are fallen people and we're here to help pick up the pieces. And just think about it. If the divorce has already happened and the people have remarried and, uh, and, and for various reasons, you know, that they got divorced, shouldn't we be the people who champion now let's make this marriage work. Let's make this marriage the best that it can. Okay. I'll give you an example. There's this man that I'm really close to in our church. He likes to hunt and fish like I do. And he, I came here and he'd been married three times, no names or anything. He'd been married three times. And then he, he found this lady and he said, I want to get married. I said, okay, under one condition. And he said, what's that? I said, I want to talk to you and the lady for a little while. I didn't call it counseling. I just said, I want to talk to you. And I really pressed on him. And, you know, he was the kind that received it real well. And, and I said, now, look, we got to make this work. We don't want this to happen again. So, I mean, I'm just saying that that's our, that's our calling really is to take people from where they are, lift them up. We show them the standard and teach them the, sta the standard. And I'm happy to say this man has been married. I think it's almost 15 years now. Uh, yeah. He's been married to the same lady and they're doing very well. So, you know, the, it's, it just goes back, you know, the church is a hospital for sinners. And, you know, we didn't even mention that early on when we were in this interview, Craig, is that sometimes it's not abandonment. Sometimes it's not abuse. Sometimes it's sinfulness or something that has gone wrong. And, uh, and even then, though, even then, are we supposed to try to go out and reach that one and try to help them and restore their life and restore their marriage and so forth the best that we can? You know, so even when it is not a result of something somebody else did, it's our own fault or their own fault or whatever, you know, then we still are called. That's our calling to try to reach people, present everyone complete in Christ. That's what we're about. Amen. That's so well said. Um, I know our time's about to go. I'll, I'll end with just two points. The first is resources. There's no question, as you said, the divorce rate is high. It's, it doesn't look that much different in the church than it does the secular world. There's, you know, it's just as high. And so, as you said earlier, that if people try marriage a second time, which most do, the divorce rate actually goes even a little higher. And so we've got to find a way to stop, as you just said in this great example, stop divorce, stabilize the family, prevent, you know, keep going down the same road. So there's tools, there's resources, there's books, there's conferences that are now available. Obviously, we hope our ministry can be one of those uh, that can help stabilize the family and prevent re-divorce. Um, that's obviously a great tool. I'd like you to speak to that. I'm grateful that there's other resources that are out there as well, but why is that so important? They can come to one lesson and get inspired, but they're going to run out of gas real quick if they don't know what to do when they leave that church service. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, part of the reason for resources is you don't know whoever the, lay, the Lord is going to lay on their heart to help lead your small group ministry or your Bible study or whatever. And it could be somebody who's been through this and they will have some things that they have learned. And obviously they have the scriptures and so forth, but it could also be somebody who doesn't, hasn't been through a divorce, doesn't have a lot of divorce in their immediate family. And they need to know, you know, what are, what are some things that about these folks that I need to know that I need to be aware of? I mean, I just think resources, you know, are, are very valuable for all of us in so many areas. So why not this area? And you have some great resources. You really do. And we've used those in Bible studies and still are using them. So uh, they're great, the books and uh, everything, you know, and I would encourage that. I'm not trying to sell tapes and uh, videos and all that, but the resources are important to bring out things that we who are not divorced need to be made aware of, you know, that are going on in people's lives. Yeah. Thank you. you bet. The, the last one, and I, I'm just going to ask you here in a second, just to speak to other pastors across maybe America, who knows, maybe other parts of the, the world, if they ever watch this. You have been a pastor. You know a pastor's world. You know how they think. You know the pressures of being a pastor. You know the perks of being, I mean, you've walked this, lived this. You're the lead senior pastor at your church. 
talk to other pastors that might be watching this and go, hmm, maybe we do need to do something for blended families in our church. But from pastor to a pastor, just share your heart for, as we close from them, if you would, Rick. Okay, I'll try to do that, Greg. Thank you. Yes, you know, I, got, I, I became a Christian a little bit late in life. I was 23 years old, and I can remember what it's like to be lost. I can remember that. And I'm so grateful to God for all that he's done for me. And so I've been a pastor now about 35 years, which is not that long for somebody my age, but it has been my joy to be a pastor. And I do know, I do know the, the struggles and difficulties that pastors face. And there are so many, I mean, they're legion, you can't name them all, but you know, among those uh, struggles are Everybody has something that they feel like that you should emphasize. And there are no uh, small amount of conferences that are telling you you've got to do this and you've got to do that and the other thing. And so, you know, it, it gets to be difficult sometimes what to emphasize and what not to and all that. You know, you've got to preach, obviously, the scriptures. You have to counsel. You have, I have a list right here of 20, 25 people in hospitals right now, you know, that are in the Metroplex area. And you have to take care of your own soul. You have to feed your own soul. And if you don't do that, you'll dry up and blow away. You have your family, your own family, and so forth. You know the drill most of these guys do. So what about this, okay? This is an area that is of great need right now in our country. A lot of people, you know, we have the rise of the nuns, those that are supposedly not going to church. And I think sometimes it's because we're not connecting with where they are. We don't really realize the situation that they're in. Maybe they've given up on church. So I'm not saying that this has to drive everything that a person does or anything at all. But I really believe that it is something that you should give attention to, pray about, ask God if he can at least help you bring the awareness to the congregation. And, you know, I have served in small churches. I preached one time to eight people. And I have preached to large congregations. We're in a little bit larger church now, and it's a real blessing. They're all blessed. So it doesn't matter the church size. It really doesn't. This goes across all church sizes. You have people who are hurting, whom you can help. And just to start somewhere, you just got to start and ask God to help you with the awareness of this. And then as you get to move along, God will provide. He will show you where you can go. Maybe somebody will come alongside that you can kind of uh, designate this will be our point person on this and then go from there. Uh, you know, where there's a willing heart, there is a way and God will provide. Uh, just encourage all pastors to at least give it some time and give it some attention. You know, get one of the books, get a book and that talks about this and kind of see, go through the chapters. You can leaf through it in a matter of minutes. And I think you can see this really connects with people that are sitting in the pews. That's great. I agree. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, I couldn't agree more as we close about to connect. Uh, if you connect with the heart, they're going to feel valued. So thank you so much, Rick. And we appreciate your friendship and God's best at Northside. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And uh, we will. We'll try to have you down before long. We need to do that. Okay. Things are going well and they're going better because you helped us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Have a you great evening. God bless. God bless. Bye. Thanks for listening today. Be sure and follow us on our Facebook page and Instagram at Blended Together Forever. And look for our upcoming events on our website and our resources, the books that we're working on at blendedtogether.org. Mm -hmm.